Um, I'm going to now introduce uh, our uh, keynote speaker for the day, uh, who really needs uh, no introduction uh, to this audience. Um, but uh, for the sake of uh, just, uh, just, just a few words, Justice uh, Chandrachud uh, was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court uh, in 2016. Before that, he served as the Chief Judge of the Allahabad High Court. Uh, he was uh, uh, called to the bench uh, of the Bombay High Court in 2000. Uh, and before that held a number of positions. He was Additional Solicitor General of India uh, and designated uh, uh, in 1998 uh, as a senior uh, advocate. He also has a very strong foot in the academic world and you can see why his opinions are so rich uh, and such a delight for us academics. In fact, when I first made contact with him, I said, uh, you know, I'm so glad that, there are, that now uh, we, we have judgments that uh, we are very excited to teach in class because as academics, we always look for uh, extremely uh, thought-provoking judgments that have serious intellectual depth, uh, and I think uh, uh, given that he keeps one foot uh, in, uh, in legal academia and engages with the universities uh, and others and, and, and thinking, we can see the richness in his opinions. He's, he's been a visiting professor of comparative constitutional law at the University of Mumbai. Uh, he's a visiting professor at Oklahoma University of Law uh, and has delivered lectures uh, at Harvard, Yale, uh, uh, University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, uh, been a speaker at uh, several of these forums. Uh, and uh, of course, in India, uh, he is now one of our uh, one of our dearest judges for upholding values close to many of our hearts uh, and uh, being courageous enough to dissent uh, when the uh, case deserves a dissent. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, we will have. Uh, much more interesting, exciting judgments that will shape the law in India in the years to come and really make Indian jurisprudence uh, richer, more diverse, more plural, uh, uh, better for us to teach, better for you to learn, uh, and uh, setting a standard not just for India, uh, but uh, but around the globe. So, sir, with, uh, can I please invite you uh, to... to, to, to Thank you so much. Thanks ever so much, uh, Professor Shamnath Bashir. It's really a, it's a great pleasure and uh, joy to be here. Um, many years ago, I was um, on an interview panel for the Rhodes Scholarships. And um, the chair of the panel was uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy. And I would sit back and uh, listen to his very wide experience of life, not just of law, but of life in general. And we had this young student who came and said, I want to, I want to pursue uh, my research, postgraduate research, a law student, in technology and the law. And I think that was probably fodder for the, for the chairperson. So the chairperson said, um, uh, tell me something. He said, um, how nano is nanotechnology? So, here was a student then, the student of course was trying to uh, hazard an answer. And in the midst of that discussion, uh, Pat came the uh, point, why don't you think like a lawyer? <laughs> and why don't you answer like a lawyer? And that really has been something which has uh, been a, a, a short sentence on which I have reflected for the last decade or so since that interview took place sometime in 2007 or eight. Uh, which is that we expect our young lawyers, our young students, to think like lawyers and perhaps to speak like lawyers. Now, on a personal note, I must tell you that for the last 36 years that I've uh, spent in the legal profession, uh, first as a, as a lawyer and then as a judge, it's been the same routine. You get into your black and white every morning and then you go off to court and where the only thing is that when you become a senior counsel instead of the black coat, you, you, you wear a monkey jacket, as I call it, as judges call it. And I thought it's particularly symbolic that the judge's jacket is called the monkey jacket in India. But I begin my day every morning and, and wear a, try and pick out a nice colorful tie, um, if only to remind oneself that this tendency of lawyers, of judges to wear black and white, which is now almost an invariable uniform for all of us, is something that I think detracts from realizing that in our effort for homogeneity in the profession, you sort of lose out 
on the intricacies of social life with which we are interacting every moment of our lives. And, and we tend to lose our individuality, which I believe is our strength in this quest for bringing homogeneity to the law. So let me begin by telling you a story as we talk of storytelling. Um, years ago, I was sitting as a judge in the Parsi Matrimonial Court in the Bombay High Court. Now, I'm sure some of you would know this, that the only jurisdiction in India today, apart from the coroner's court, the only real serious jurisdiction where there is a jury trial is the Parsi Matrimonial Court. And the jury trial is presided over by a judge of the high court. That these are ma not matters which go to the family court. And so I was hearing this uh, jury trial. You have uh, jurors, nine jurors, and many of them take their jobs very seriously. They are neurologists, they are chartered accountants, they are surgeons, and they come and they, they are people from the civil services. But they come and act as jurors as a service to the community to uh, try and bring a, a fast dwindling community together, especially when spouses are, uh, are, in, are in dispute. So I had this divorce proceeding which was brought by uh, a man who is I believe somewhere between 80 and 90, so probably 85. We'll, we'll take the average and say he was an 85-year-old Parsi who brought this divorce proceeding against his spouse, who must have been perhaps around the same age, or I, 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 I don't quite remember now. And his story was something like this. He says, well, I was in the Merchant Navy, and I, uh, I went to Denmark to get my enhanced pension. There was a problem with my pension. And when I come back to my, when I come back to my apartment, what do I find, sir? He says, I find that my living room has been bifurcated with a brick wall into two. So I'm just shut out of half my house. So then um, I said, so what do you do then? Don't you want, why do you want a divorce? You are, you're close to now 85, uh, you're, in, you're in your 80s, you're an octogenarian. He says, no, but I'm deeply hurt at the way I've been treated. So I said, well, okay, there was this brick wall which was put up in your living room overnight when you came back to Mumbai. What else has happened that uh, leads you to this kind of a situation? So he says, it's not just the brick wall. He says, what I'm really offended by is that she's walked away with my pet dog. <laughs> and he says, sir, what compounds this grave breach of moral ethics is the fact that she's broken off, she's walked off with our wedding album of photographs. <laughs> so I said, but I thought you wanted a divorce. He says, yes. I said, what are you going to do with your wedding album? So he said, memories. And uh, so um, that, that it just sort of, uh, you know, stories like this tell you about uh, the fact that human relationships are not always cast in stone, they are not in fact cast in stone. And um, what you find in courts every day in that sense is a human story unfolding in every case. Yesterday we had a small case, a very, very small little case out of the 70 that we had to hear yesterday. It was a case of this human being, who, this person who, whose house was demolished for the Ara to Sasaram railway line. And the railways have a policy that will give you employment if your house is completely taken away. And he had gone to the single judge, he had gone and appealed to the division bench, then he had gone and remanded to the single judge, then to the division bench, and here he was, this little individual, right before us in the Supreme Court. And he had been ousted on the ground that if it's only a strip of land which is acquired, you're not entitled to uh, you're not entitled to employment for the simple reason that a strip of land is, after all, so, so little for the government, for the power of the union government, that it's not worth giving you a job. I think that seems to be the logic of that, uh, of that position. But he said, look, look at the next part which says, but if your house is completely taken away, then irrespective of how small a strip of land was, you're still entitled to employment. So we should notice, and we said, let's hear the government and see what we can do in this case. But this think like a lawyer that I told you a short while ago is also something which I think we need to reflect on a little bit. Because what do witnesses give? Witnesses in a court give you their testimony. What do clients share? 
Clients share their confidences. What do counsel do? Counsel makes submissions in a court. How are contracts entered into? Contracts are negotiated. What do judges do? Judges give opinions or judgments. They hand down or they, if you want to be even more orthodox, they deliver judgments. What does legislation do? It gives you a statute. What do spouses do when they communicate with each other? They're engaged in an act of privileged communication. So what we try and do, I think, in the forms of our law is essentially to reduce the human element in the law, in the human element of what we do in terms of these constructs, which basically mask the essential nature of human relationships, which is something not really so much which is as impersonal as the law would make it out to be, but which reflects deep issues of prejudice, deep issues of wrongdoing, deep issues of injustice, as you see almost every day of your life. Let me begin by telling you about a story on the next part of this presentation this morning, a story which Professor Mulchan Sharma uh, so brilliantly explained to us in, in his class between 1979 and 1980, and which is the tale of the Spellution Explorers, which was written off by Long Fuller. I wrote about Fuller recently in my, one of my judgments. I don't, I'm not sure how relevant it was, but I had to get it in into that judgment by referring to the polycentric web. <laughs> so this, the, the Spellution Explorers is a fictional creation of the American legal scholar, as I told you. The central characters were five individuals who were caught in a very cruel situation. While on an expedition, it, it reminds you of this little story we've been reading out in the newspapers about the Thai kids who were, who were caught in that cave. So while on an expedition, they found themselves trapped in the interior of the cave due to a landslide. Without food, which was necessary for their survival, the explorers did the unimaginable on the 23rd day of their entrapment, which is they consumed the flesh of one of their companions to avoid death by starvation. Huge efforts were made to rescue these explorers, and 10 people lost their lives in the process. The explorers only managed their escape on the 32nd day of their confinement. Upon their rescue, the four explorers were tried and convicted for the offense of murder by the trial court. And the statute said what any statute on murder would probably say, whoever shall willfully take the life of another shall be punishable with death or shall be punished with death. We would strike it down as a mandatory death penalty here, but that's uh, besides the point. According to the defendant's testimony, it was the deceased explorer, the person whose flesh was consumed, who had suggested the arrangement, which involved selection by a roll of dice. And he got cold feet at the last minute. He said, well, I don't want to participate. But when the dice was rolled, it was his turn to die and to be eaten up. So as luck would have it, he was a chosen person for the sacrifice, for the human sacrifice under the agreement. Their appeal went before a bench of five judges of the fictional Supreme Court of New Garth. Hello, please come. <laughs> Lovely to have you here. So through, there were five brilliantly crafted judgments, all divergent opinions. Fuller brought into focus the choices that the judges faced when they were confronted with describing them as permanent problems of the human race. So each of these judges, each of these judges spoke about the human side of his story. This was a story of five people in a cave, uh, each of whom uh, was lost in that cave for very long. Um, they were to be uh, rescued. They didn't know how soon the rescue would come. So they decided to kill one of them. So they killed one of them, they ate the flesh up, and then when they came out and they were rescued, they were tried. So five judges decided their fate. Each judge acted on his moral impulse, or her moral impulse, and relied on a philosophy they believed to be applicable to the circumstances, ascribing different identities to the explorers. 
Some call them pragma pragmatic survivors. Others, cold-blooded murderers or sinners. The moral story. I will briefly deal on the judgments to illustrate how, when presented with the same facts, each judge constructed a different narrative of the characters and facts before them, colored by their own understanding of the purpose of the law and how it governs individual life. The first judge lamented that the explorers found themselves to be in a tragic situation, as he called it, and acknowledged the unfortunate circumstances which entitled them to clemency. However, he believed that, well, I couldn't grant clemency because the statute was so clear, because here was a case of murder and death, and therefore the death penalty applied. So he said, instead, the best thing to do was to remit this matter to the executive to decide the issue of clemency. So here was a judge who decided not to decide the case himself, but then uh, remit it to the executive. The second judge, we sometimes have judges like that, judges who don't want to take a decision, the hard decision. <laughs> the second judge undertook a rather creative interpretation of the law and facts before him. In the narrative constructed by the judge, the men found themselves not in a state of civil society. He said, but good heavens, the death penalty applies and murder applies when you're in a state of civil society. But they were in a state of nature. He held that they drew a new charter of government appropriate to the situation which the, in which they found themselves. And the law of the Commonwealth was not applicable to the explorers. The judge further reasoned that a man whose life was under threat will repel his aggressor, whatever the law may say. And the legal exception of self-defense was applicable to the explorers. How do you place the Sentinelese who killed this American just the other day? Uh, would that fit into this paradigm which the judge spoke of, of the law of nature governing the situation? The third judge stated that the conviction for their actions would have been an absurdity because 10 heroic lives have been lost in saving these individuals. And are you going to now kill them for having committed murder? He vacillated between being sympathetic towards the explorers and, find, and finding disgust at the monstrous nature of their crime. But he was unable to ignore these contrary emotions which came into his heart and ultimately he did something again which a few judges do sometimes, which is that he recused himself from hearing the case any further. <laughs> the fourth judge gave primacy to the wording of the law, the language of the law. He didn't dwell on the narratives. For him, the law, he said that the exception of self-defense would not apply, as the deceased bore no threat to the other judges. He was not about to kill them, so where was the question of self-defense? And he said that I will apply the law as it stands, and these are all people who have to be convicted of murder and hence be sentenced to death. The fifth judge observed that the judiciary is likely to lose touch with a common citizen and in the process of applying legal principles, facts and narratives are generally turned to dust. He decided to read through all the legalese and rely on common sense. And what did common sense dictate to him? He noted that the four men had endured more humiliation than most men in a thousand years and held that the explorers ought to be acquitted of the charges. Is something like that done by our courts when we have death penalty, death row convicts whose appeals have been dismissed, who have no hope of resurrection. But then when a writ is filed, we say, well, 20 years in solitary row is sufficient to lead to the conclusion that the execution of the death penalty would be contrary to the right to life and arbitrary and violative of Article 14. But what happened in Newgarth, in the Supreme Court of Newgarth, was that the Supreme Court was evenly divided, and hence the sentence of death was affirmed. The cause of the Spelusian explorers is telling of how the same set of facts can yield different narratives which played a crucial role in determining the reality that judges constructed. Therefore, the narratives that judges chose to create and rely on shaped their idea of what a just outcome would be in a given set of circumstances. One of the cases which really has never ceased to trouble me is about this death penalty verdict of our court several years ago, where a bench of three judges decided to convict the accused and sentence him to death. 
when one of the three colleagues was of the view that not, more, not only was this case not a case for death penalty, but this was a case for acquittal. So where one of the three judges tells you that this is a case for acquittal and not even a case for death, will you then by a majority convict, which is fine, then would you sentence that person to death? Would you not then accept that one out of your colleagues feels that it's a case not merely not for the award of death penalty, but even a case for acquittal? As novelists shape the narratives of the characters in their stories, judges rely on the facts before them to craft a narrative they believe to be most probable in the circumstances of each case. Like writers, judges are intuitive reasoners and a lot of our creative thinking is unconscious. I hate to admit this, but a lot of our thinking is very intuitive and unconscious. It better be because we had to dispose of 70 cases yesterday in all of uh, four and a half, five hours of work. Of course, it dragged down to close to seven yesterday. A novelist writes a story in a certain way because it feels right. But the same has to be supported with a plot and well-constructed characters. Likewise, judges often have a strong sense of which, which way a case should be decided. But good judges always like to explain their decisions. Judges, I dare say, may be considered as artists in their own right. Like artists, judges employ craftsmanship with creativity in creating judicial opinions. The craftsmanship of a judge, as well as of the novelist, depends largely on their ability to employ a relevant set of facts and articulate them through words. Stories, as well as judgments, serve as forms of dialogue, which require their authors to effectively engage with their audiences and resonate with their lived experiences. Very often in a court of law you find, right at the outset of a case, that there's nothing that can be done in this case. A case of injustice still has to be rectified in accordance with law. And you find that there may be injustice, but there's no legal violation. But sometimes you then hear these stories. You hear stories which are unfolded before you. And I've found that hearing a story is as much of the process of healing as the outcome that the judge dispenses. Very often, outcomes which appear to be just to a judge are not just to individuals who come before the judge. But very often, the real catharsis for an individual lies in the fact that she was heard in court. Not in the fact that she lost a case, but that a judge heard the sadness the injustice, which perhaps the system was too weak to confront. Dworkin draws an, an interesting analogy between law and stories. He states that the law is like a chain novel. Successive interpreters and composers of novels all work on subsequent chapters and build on what has already been written. After an author writes the first chapter, the second chapter elaborates on the first chapter and follows its plot line. In this manner, the discretion with each subsequent chapter is reduced. Similarly, precedents in courts serve as a chain of command, a chain of coherence, which purports to limit the discretion that each judge has as a body of precedents grow. But as judges, we know that however cogent the line of precedent, there's always a discretion which the judge has. And that discretion again is couched, again in a legal phrase, the power to make a distinction or a distinguishing feature. So you distinguish a precedent. Now distinguishing a precedent is again a legal form. But underlying your ability to distinguish is your human ability to do what is right and to perhaps cast away a previous decision which you think is perhaps not acceptable. However, the law of precedent views the law as static and unwilling to change. When a judge is presented with a question of law, they may look at history and construct a story completely different from another judge. One judge may view the Constitution as a clear break from a colonial past, 
and question colonial legislation when another may find continuity in such laws. Judges, including good judges that I know of, believe that the sense of continuity of our law is what ensures the stability of our democratic fabric. And therefore, this sense of continuity, this sense of not having a clean break with the past, is crucial to preserve democratic legitimacy. But you have, on the other hand, judges who believe that the Constitution essentially is a transformative instrument. And the Constitution essentially, at one level, sought to bring about a transfer of political power from a colonial regime to a democratic regime. But side by side with this transfer of political power, there was another movement which is going on, and which was a movement towards a social transformation. So unless we view our Constitution as a fundamentally transformative institution, as a fundamentally transformative document, we would perhaps lose the essence of the Constitution, which is that it was intended to be a Constitution for the people, a Constitution to be interpreted in order to subserve a fundamental transformation in groups of society which were, over a period of time, discriminated against. So you may, you may deal with discrimination in the context of uh, caste, issues of Dalits. You may deal with discrimination in the context of gender. Or you may dis deal with the issue of discrimination across caste and gender, like untouchability. Does untouchability only exist in relation to the Dalits? So would you, in would you really interpret untouchability in a much broader concept, uh, which I'll come to very shortly? If the law that is constructed is to operate as more than just an expression of power, the understanding of law must involve the coming to terms with competing narratives of reality. And this is something which you see every single day in the court. The real challenge before a judge, as indeed before a lawyer, or for a matter, a policy person or a researcher, is that the conflict that you see in society is not a conflict always between right and wrong. It's also a conflict between right and right. It's sometimes a conflict between wrong and wrong. It's a conflict between right and power. And power, to the extent that it has its own legitimacy, also defines itself in terms of being right because it is in accordance with law. So conflicts, I think the, the gravest conflicts that we confront as judges are conflicts between right and right. And how do you define, how do you decide a conflict between, between rights, between two sets of rights? So this is just not limited to resolving disagreements, but must be accompanied by a deeper understanding of the nature of social reality out of which the disagreements arise. These multifaceted realities constitute the social life that the law in its application mediates and constructs. A narrative construction of reality allows a fuller understanding of the plurality of social lives that are negotiated by law. Employing narrative in informing responses to conflicts between the plurality of our social lives allows a just negotiation of conflict and to gain a holistic understanding of the reality of different lives. It provides a nuanced approach to the role of law in saying what has happened Law professor Anthony Amsterdam and psychologist Jerome Bruner have thus put it, and I'll extract a small little quote for all of you. The law lives on narrative for reasons both banal and deep. Clients tell stories to lawyers who must figure out what to make of what they hear. As clients and lawyers talk, the client's story gets recast into plights and prospects plots and pilgrimages into possible worlds. If circumstances warrant, the lawyers retell their client stories in the form of pleas and arguments to judges and testimonies to juries. Next, judges and jurors retell the stories to themselves or each other in the form of instruction, deliberations, a verdict, a set of findings, or an opinion. And then it is the turn of journalists, commentators, and critics 
This endless telling and retelling, casting and recasting, is essential to the conduct of the law. It is how law's actors comprehend whatever series of events they make the subject of their legal action. Which brings me now to the next question. Given the role of the narrative in shaping the character of justice, how must a judge construe varying narratives of identity, experience, and circumstance to further the cause of justice? As we have illustrated in the case of the Spellution Explorers, the, the hypothetical situation, any factual scenario throws up a multiplicity of narratives. However, engagement with each narrative does not in any way take away from the objectivity and determinacy of the law. It is true that the rule of law privileges legal determinacy and generality where the consistent application of prior rules must prevail. So in our quest for unraveling human stories, we're equally conversant and cognizant of the need to preserve the rule of law. And the hallmark of the rule of law is the determinacy of the law, that there should be certain outcomes. There should be outcomes which are not aberrations. But the rule of law is not and must not be construed as divorced from individuals and their experiences. Legal determinacy must not be accorded a weight that leads to discounting completely the lived experiences of those it seeks to govern. Therefore, substantive justice is necessarily contextual. I think the great challenge for the modern judge, particularly in our country, is the fact that in your effort to deal with the mass of litigation which comes before you, and to ensure that you promote a high degree of consistency, of certainty in the law, there's a grave danger that you lose individual narratives of individual injustices, which really then cast a doubt on the very legitimacy of the work which you may do. James Boyd White, uh, the pioneer of law and literature, Professor Bashir referred to the law and literature movement. He has said, law is not at heart an abstract system or scheme of rules, as we often think nor is it a set of institutional arrangements that can be adequately described in a language of social science. Rather, it is an inherently unstable structure of thought and expression, built upon a distinct set of dynamic and dialogic tensions. It is not a set of rules at all, but a form of life. It is a process by which the old is made new over and over again. If one is to talk about justice and the law, it must be in the light of this reality. So the dialogical role of the law is crucial to preserve the legitimacy of the law. If you forsake the dialogical role of the law, I dare say the law then becomes a diabolical, a diabolical instrument. And that's the grave danger which we must then confront. To view law in this holistic sense is to acknowledge the contribution of human elements of thought and expression in the development of legal structures. The legitimacy of the rule of law will also depend largely on whether the law in its application does not obscure the experiences of those it seeks to govern and particularly less privileged communities. In that sense, the judge must be circumspect to ensure that less dominant narratives, and I call it less dominant narratives, it's in a cultural context, that the less dominant narratives, which are not as vociferously presented, do not get lost. In a seminal paper, which is titled Poets as Judges, Martha Nussbaum underscores the relevance of literary imagination in judging, which allows engagement with narratives of individuals with empathy. The book which I'm currently reading is by Martha Nussbaum, Nussbaum called The Monarchy of Fear. She cites the examples of the example of Bowers versus Hardwick, which we dealt with in the 377 case on, on, on gay rights, a case in which the American Supreme Court upheld a Georgian state law criminalizing all forms of sodomy to illustrate how adjudication bereft of narrative is problematic. If you read Bowers versus Hardwick, it's a perfectly reasoned judgment, but which leaves are uh, you completely perplexed because it doesn't deal with the human elements in, 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 in that offense that was under consideration. Nussbaum noted that the majority opinion maintained a distance from the facts of Hardwick's case. 
Hardwick was being prosecuted under the anti-sodomy law. The distancing language expresses a refusal to think about how Hardwick's personhood is affected. She notes that the events are not described with a sense of familiarity, and there is a concerted effort to keep the human story at a distance. A more empathetic consideration of the situation might not have altered the judgment about how to read the precedents, but it would have led to a thorough consideration of the violation of the right to privacy. Individual or concrete human voices and laws when viewed in isolation often conflict. Written laws are often worded as general and impersonal in nature. And as students of the law, we are trained to treat like cases alike and to define similarities generally. However, this focus on only the text of the laws leads to the invalidation of individual experiences. Must we then privilege logical consistency and predictability over compassion and substantive justice? My colleague, Justice Kurin Joseph, who retired last week, said, we have something called compassionate appointment in India, which is when a member of the family dies while in service, you appoint his daughter or son or wife or uh, somebody in the family who is dependent on him. He says, the grave danger is when you forget the element of compassion in compassionate appointment. So there's the grave danger of interpreting the law without compassion is that then you miss the individual narrative which the law is really intended to subserve. Law and the narratives which unfold before it must be viewed as concrete human stories and take into account the myriad human voices. How does a court dealing with racial segregation understand its consequences without recounting the lived experience of those who suffer racial discrimination? How does a court understand the plight of manual scavengers without taking into account the social exclusion and boycott that they face? To really understand and perceive individual experiences, I would strongly recommend that our young idea scholars read uh, a book called The Ant Among Elephants. Mm -hmm. Sujata Gidla's book. These experiences and stories illuminate the law with meaning. In Navtej Johar, which we decided recently, we struck down section 377, which criminalized consensual sexual relations between persons of the same sex. The judgment highlights the importance of recording human experiences in order to understand the true impact of law. In my separate opinion, I recognize the identities of the petitioners, and I think this was crucial and recounted the experience of one person in the submissions before the court. One argument for the retention of Section 377 was that there were a minimum number of prosecutions. So why strike down something when you have virtually few prosecutions under the provision? However, the effect of Section 377 was not in its criminalization of an act, but in its silencing of a specific set of identities. It was recognized that the retention of the provision perpetuated a certain culture which is antithetical to our constitutional values. This culture and stereotype fostered by the provision silenced the identity and lived experiences of numerous individuals and perpetuated homophobic attitudes, making it almost impossible for victims of abuse to access justice. This discriminatory effect could only be captured by taking into account the lived experiences of human beings Without that, a facially neutral provision may have escaped constitutional scrutiny. As was clearly seen in the case, justice was a function of the narrative. It tells us that within the tapestry of legal scholarship and advocacy, empathy, storytelling, and different voices must be woven in. If one closely looks enough, the text of our laws have their own stories. For example, the constitutional moment is portrayed as representing triumph and victory of the decades-long struggle towards freedom. It consists of stories of struggle and a nationalist fervor to give India her independence. But are there narratives of the partition years that didn't find their way into the mainstream narrative of triumph, glory, and freedom? Stories of separation, of sexual savagery, and violence. More than 50 years after the events took place, Urvashi Butalia, in a book titled The Other Side of Silence, 
has recounted the experiences of women during partition in what she describes as the euphoric, hopeful, and simultaneously bloody moment of the birth of the nation. The notion of women as property, as belonging to their respective families, their communities, and men, led to a routine violation of their rights under the law. Let me give you an example. In 1947, the government of India and Pakistan signed the Inter-Dominion Treaty. This treaty spoke of both the governments recovering what they termed as abducted women. The Abducted Persons Recovery and Restoration Ordinance was transformed into a legislation of 1949. Government of India set up an implementation machinery to arrive at a definition of abducted women. A set of individuals which were also, who were also displaced by partition were post-abduction children. Complications, complicated questions presented themselves. How does one decide whether someone was abducted? What if a person went of her own free will? How does one propose to find these women? Would the recovered woman be accepted by conservative families upon their return? What about the fate of children whose families were torn apart? For an impersonal agency, it was easier to not account for these questions and lived experiences and set a time, date, and figure to solve the problem. As the violence in Punjab had by some accounts started in 1947, any woman living with, in the company of, or in a relationship with a man of the other religion, after 1 March 1947, would be presumed to have been abducted. All marriages and conversions after this date would not be recognized by the two governments. When the law assumed force, the narratives of women and children, no matter what they said, no matter how much they protested, or no matter how real the relationship was, was completely destroyed. The act was silent about couples that had conceived. There were two kinds of post-abduction children, those born to abducted Muslim women in India and subsequently recovered, and children born to abducted Hindu women and then recovered. In most cases, the children stayed on with their fathers, the abductors. The stories of these separated families is gut-wrenching. There are numerous stories of women who protested. How could they trust these men willing to take them away? What of the atrocities carried out in the process? What of the stories of separation of children from their mothers? Here the state agenda was carried out in the body of the woman, recovered women, were not seen as free adults who could exercise their own agency, but as missing members of a community. So a woman was pictured not as an individual of, with her own agency, but as a member of a community. They were viewed as repositories of family, community, and national honor. The law here was built on its violence to the narrative of women and children by silencing their story of forced separation. Therefore, to deny narrative is to deny identity. Multifaceted identities are produced by association with different groups, societies, and cultures, each of which subsumes a different narrative. And let's not forget that India's narrative is this narrative of plurality, of diversity, which is the essence of the freedom which at least we visualize for, for the future. So to deny narrative is to deny identity. Multifaceted identities are produced by association with different groups, societies, and cultures, each of which subsumes a distinct narrative. Justice as a narrative compels us to give recognition to voices and experiences that are lost in the process. We must remember that to ignore the narrative on which the law is built is to further the violence that is meted out in its inception. Our constitution itself is built on various narratives. It carries the hue of the hopes and aspirations of a populace that has known oppression and is hopeful of a new freedom. This is reflected in the broad contours of the rights enunciated in the constitution. The narrative of our constitution is a vision of transformation
to obliterate practices and values which are antithetical to the values of liberty and dignity, which is to galvanize social reform. Just as Vivian Bose in 1955 in Virendra Singh said, the Constitution blotted out in one magnificent sweep all vestiges of arbitrary and despotic power in the territories of India and over its citizens and lands. The past was obliterated except where expressly preserved. At one moment of time, the new order was born with its new allegiance, springing from the same source for all. Grounded on the same basis, the sovereign will of the peoples of India with no class, no caste, no race, no creed, no distinction, no reservation. The text and silences of our constitution reflect this and must be borne in mind in reading and interpreting the constitution. The oppression faced by citizens of our nation in the colonial era led the makers of independent India to strive for an egalitarian society for our future citizens, devoid of all forms of oppressive discrimination. It was in furtherance of this that the drafters of the constitution included a provision to counteract the social malaise of untouchability which plagued Indian society. About 68 years after its enactment in the Sabrimala temple entry case, our court was tasked with interpreting the provision in the light of the indignity suffered by women as a result of a long-standing belief that menstruation is impure. Taking into account the history of ex exclusion faced by women, I held in my separate opinion that the treatment of menstruation as a form of impurity amounted to the practice of untouchability. Until now, it was largely believed that the interpretation of untouchability as contained in Article 17 was limited to practice relating to caste-based exclusion. The narratives of women who have faced exclusion due to the stigma attached to menstruation has seldom been acknowledged. In fact, in many sections of society, menstruation is never discussed thus relegating a part of the reproductive experience of the woman to non-existence, a suppression of their experiences. The taboo on menstruation is an ugly stain on the story of social change which our constitutional visualizes. Through my interpretation in Sabrimala, I held this social malpractice to be unconstitutional. But yet, let us not forget that we as judges have a peripheral role, though an important role. The story of the Constitution has been written by multiple actors, notwithstanding the contributions of the drafters of the Constitution. The Constitution as it exists today is a product of continuing interaction between three elements, the courts, and above all, the people, and the text. It is the people of the nation which, in recognizing their rights, come before the courts, compelling a reconsideration of narratives, some pre-existing, some newly emerged, and some disregarded so far. In that sense, it allows a revisiting of narrative. Every interpretation of the Constitution is a retelling of its story, heaving influenced by the social milieu of our times. The reading of the Constitution being a dynamic process, it must take into account new challenges which confront society and evolve to accommodate newly formed social and political identities. Because the identities are not cast in stone again. Identities themselves are fluid, just as our experiences about life have an essential element of fluidity. It was in that sense that Ambed Dr. Ambedkar said that the reading of the Constitution being a dynamic process must take into account new challenges which confront society and evolve to accommodate these identities which are constantly being altered. And he said that the Constitution is not merely a lawyer's document. It is a vehicle of life, and its spirit is always the spirit of the age. The letter of the Constitution is written in the language of emancipation from economic, political, and social injustice. The spirit of the Constitution, in essence, is the spirit of social progress a spirit which is also captured in the values of the IDEA initiative and project. The IDEA program is structured towards changing the narrative of law schools and the legal profession by postulating hard-hitting questions about privilege and about increasing access to legal education. In doing so, IDEA, I believe, is dismantling social structures 
which exclude a vast section of society from being represented in the legal profession. It is my belief that granting representation will also ensure a fresh infusion of experiences and narratives offered by these individuals into the legal profession, and it is the profession which will be the richer for it. With a legal education, each of you scholars has the potential to impact society. Of course, you will be armed with knowledge and objectivity. I always tell my law clerks and interns that in your reading for the big ticket cases, don't forget the essential aspects of the civil procedure, the essential aspects of evidence, the essential aspect of all your basic legislation which is good enough for you to tackle the esoteric issues which all the uh, young uh, lawyers like to confront. With a legal education, each of you has the potential to impact society. Of course, while you will be armed with knowledge and objectivity, your stories teach each of us that empathy and compassion find a significant place in this profession. As I end my presentation this morning, I hope I have left you with some thoughts to reflect on. For the purpose of a storyteller is not, tell you, is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. So I, as I leave you this morning, I hope I've given you some questions to think upon. Thank you very much.